Well, are you ready to grow? Then let's dive in together. I invite you to take your Bible, whether turn or tap, to Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 11, as I read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live, humanity shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If, same thing, you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings in the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, for once again it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. We want you to notice four things on the outset of our adventure together. First, in this moment, Jesus knew what the Holy Spirit was at work doing in his life. Secondly, in every trial, Jesus trusted the character of God, of his Father. In each season, thirdly, in each season, Jesus knew the difference between temptation and truth. Finally, to overcome the work of Satan, the flesh, the world in which we live, Jesus engaged specific spiritual practices. Pastor Lori? And so today we want to lead you through an exercise to help you do exactly what Jesus did through what Jay just read today. We're going to use Jesus as our model as we quiet our hearts to listen to the Holy Spirit today. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to need a pen or notebook or paper or a device, something to take some notes, something to ponder and to think through as we lead you through some listening exercises today. And you can go to lifecenter.org and on our Christmas page, you're gonna find a download of the exercises that we're gonna to do today and the questions that we're gonna lead you through. And you can follow along on this download. Our Orleans, Cornwall and, and Canada campus pastors are gonna lead you through each step. And we pray that you're going to meet with God in a powerful way today. God is a personal God. He loves you more than you could ever know. And he knows everything about you and he still loves you completely. Wow. And he wants you to invite him into the hidden spaces of your life. He's trustworthy and he wants to breathe fresh life into you today. He wants to empower you by his spirit to overcome the temptations of the enemy, just like Jesus did. And as you look forward to 2022, look with expectation and hope for all that God wants to do. Take a moment to prepare your heart yeah. by thanking God for what he has done in 2021. Whether through hardship or through victory, God is absolutely faithful. So as we worship to this next song, let's anchor our hearts in a heart of gratitude as we prepare for the journey we're gonna go on together today. Let's do it. Matthew 4, 1 tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit. And I truly believe that God is leading us to His table together. Church, today I want to begin by encouraging each of you in this season. With our country filled with chaos and confusion, there is a King who is with us and who has already prepared the way for us. There is a renewed call to fix our eyes on Him. We cannot always choose our circumstances and we cannot always choose our storms, but we can choose who we are following and how. As a church family, we are in a season of building and laboring and God's desire is to use each and every one of us to build His church. There is an invite to follow our King. God is speaking and God is leading each of us to come to come to His table, the Father's table. And as we come to His table, the invite continues. It is 
to re-engage in community so we can respond by serving and building together. Life Center family, we need you to come back to church. We need you to serve and we need you to pray. God's voice, His leading and Lordship is to be the priority of our lives. And as God leads us, it will continually require us to take intentional steps to continue doing life together in community and to contend for unity. It is a time of moving in the opposite spirit. It's not a time to be on the sidelines waiting for someone else to do the work or thinking that someone else can take your place. There's an urgent, individual yet collective call for each of us to labor and build together in community, unified. Is it easy? No. For it requires the sacrifice of our time, finances, gifts, pride, and in humility, walking lovingly together. Is it worth it? Yes. To move in the opposite spirit, which is the way of God's kingdom, we must pray and intentionally walk in sacrificial obedience as we are led by Him. And I want to encourage you, keep engaging with our church community and keep contending for unity. Matthew 4.1 also tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. God is leading us even in a wilderness, despite our circumstances, to His provision from His table, which has been made available to us. At the Father's table, there is an abundance of provision for all that we need is provided by Him. No matter our circumstance or the wilderness seasons we may find ourselves in, the Holy Spirit is at work. We tend to live circumstantially. So how do we discover the Holy Spirit is working, what He is doing in our lives? Well, I love this quote from Oswald Chambers. It says this, Does it really matter that our circumstances are difficult? Why shouldn't they be? If we give way to self-pity and indulge in the luxury of misery, we remove God's riches from our lives and hinder others from entering into His provision. No sin is worse than the sin of self-pity because it removes God from the throne of our lives, replacing Him with our own self-interest. It causes us to open our mouths only to complain and we simply become spiritual sponges, always and only absorbing never giving, and never being satisfied. And there is nothing lovely or generous about our lives. Wow. However, in contrast, God's table is abundant. May we open our mouths in gratitude to all the provisions He has given us so we can then pour out generously our thanks and our praise to God. For we are each a living testimony of God's grace, and our lives are to be a display of His beauty, goodness, and faithfulness. And by doing so, we will make a difference since people will be drawn to eat and drink from the ta ta Father's table with us. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Today, I declare, that your spirit would be filled with the God's faithful provision and goodness as you choose to come to his table and taste and see that he is good. May you experience this abundant provision for all that your heart and spirit needs in your specific circumstance. God's heart is to fill you to overflowing today. His heart is for your spirit to be nourished and to flourish in his perfect love. We have an amazing song that our Life Center team wrote last year that we want to play again, and it talks about coming to the Father's table. It is an invitation that you only need to respond to. Pull up your chair, dine and feast on the goodness of God so you can share this bounty with those around you. For our world is eating from a table, but not from the Father's table. Only His provision satisfies, brings perfect peace, and completely restores. Jesus purchased with his blood your VIP invite to the Father's table. There's a reservation for you with your name on it forever. Today, will you come to the Father's table? And during this next song, I would love for you to reflect on these few questions. What is the next step for you to come to his table to re-engage in community? 
and from his table, what provision are you needing today? I have a severe allergy to peanuts. And one time I had accidentally eaten peanuts and was rushed to the hospital. And it was very serious and I was lying there in the hospital bed with my body shutting down on me and my lungs tiring out and everything inside of me wanted to scream. I wanted to run around the room and, and get as many breaths as possible. And I was breathing as fast as I possibly could to try to, to take in more oxygen. And the nurse that was attending to me uh, stopped me and said, Look, this is going to feel completely contrary to your instincts right now, but you need to slow down your breathing. Instead of taking rush breaths, I want you to take long and slow breaths. And it was against everything that was in my nature to do. But by slowing down my breathing, it was the one thing that I believe saved my life. It's often like that when it comes to trusting God. Uh, sometimes it feels like our ways go completely contrary to his ways. That our nature wants to go in one direction and God is calling us to go in a different direction. That he wants to lead us in towards uh, the path of righteousness, but our sinful nature instinctively just wants to go its own way, its own path. Trusting God can be a challenge. Yet, it is one of the most important lessons that we need to learn as disciples of Jesus. Matthew writes that after 40 days and 40 nights, that Jesus was hungry. I mean, hung hunger is when you haven't eaten for 40 hours. Starving is what you would feel after not eating for 40 days and 40 nights. And the tempter knew that if there was ever a moment for him to do to Jesus what he was able to do to Adam and Eve, it was right then and right there. And so Satan tempts Jesus three different times, but these three different temptations were really just the one same and same temptation. And that is, it, the temptation was to uproot Jesus' trust that he had placed in the Father. If you are the Son of God, the tempter said, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. That was a direct challenge to the trust that Jesus had placed in his Father's plan and will. Jesus had one goal on this earth. John chapter 6 verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Everything Jesus did, everything, everywhere Jesus went, everything he said, it was to fulfill his Father's will. And he invites you today to put your trust in him the same way that he put his trust in the Father. So today, let me ask you this question. Where are you most challenged to trust Jesus? Perhaps it is his authority as Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe it's his provision and learning how to trust him with your finances. Or what about the teachings and practices of Jesus? Are you struggling to forgive? Are you needing discipline to pray? Do you need to commit yourself more to community in 2022? There are many challenges to trusting Jesus, but I want to encourage you with this. While it is hard at times to trust Jesus, it is not impossible. The Holy Spirit will help you the same way he helped Jesus to place his trust in the Father. We're going to play a, a, another song right now, but I want you in this moment to think and write down where you are most challenged to trust Jesus. But as you write, remember the words of Paul when he said to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As we recognize an area that God is asking us to hand over or where we're facing a greater challenge or more temptation, it can seem daunting and even impossible to give God control and to allow him to lead. Often these areas are the places where we want to use coping mechanisms or use what seems natural or how we've always managed it to take care of these things. We often allow flesh to lead, the wide road. And so God's way can feel really uncomfortable and unnatural. I remember a time when God was working on uh, peace and rest in my life. And he was trying to give me this supernatural peace, 
trying to teach me to rest in him. And I kept uh, feeling like I needed to fight it and push against it. It felt incredibly unnatural. It, it felt so uncomfortable. And yet God was saying, just rest in me, Ingrid. And why would I reject this? Why would I push against it? Well, because of that discomfort, because it felt like instead I actually needed to be going on adrenaline, I needed to be taking control, I needed to be restless and busy because that's how I'd always done it. So because it feels unnatural, because it feels counterintuitive, I had to discipline myself to take that rest, to take that peace. It takes discipline to trust God and who he says he is. He never changes. He is 100% trustworthy. He has never ever and will never fail to follow through on his promises or to be true to the character he says he has. And we need to trust him in that. It is so important that we know the God that we serve. We cannot make it without getting to know him for we will easily be deceived by the enemy. If we read a little farther down in Matthew 4, we see that Satan tempted Jesus in verses five to seven. And this is what he says, let's read it together. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. We can see here that the devil challenges who God the Father said Jesus is and uses a portion of scripture in Psalm 91 to tempt him to prove his identity in a manner that doesn't line up at all with how the Father was asking him to live and who the Father is. But Jesus knows his Father. He knew his Father so well and he knew that this went against the character of God. And so he used scripture to stand against it and say that he was not going to do this. It is so important that we stand on the character of God. Staying anchored to God and on the path that he has for us is a choice. It won't just happen. It doesn't just come naturally. It is something we must choose daily. Who God is, is what we must choose over our circumstances, our thoughts, how it has always been, or who we think we are. Isaiah 55, eight to nine says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration, for as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are always the best ways. We can fully rely on his leading. Take time to get to know God. Read his word. Spend time in prayer. Surround yourself with people who know God. As you listen to this next song, reflect on who God is. What specific attribute of God, will, of his character, will help you in the area that you're struggling in, that you have identified? I encourage you to write this down and remind yourself daily of this truth. You need to stand firmly on this truth. Who God is, is so important. You need to fix your eyes on him not your circumstances and struggle. Isaac Newton once said that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And I am so glad that we really don't have to worry about that. That only really applies to the laws of physics. When it comes to the temptations we face, when it comes to the war in our hearts between spirit and flesh, we serve a God who has no equal. The victory is in his hands. Can I get an amen? Well, we've been speaking about temptations and challenges and the tests we face, and we can take courage in the fact that Christ is in all things for us, that through him, all things become possible when we're looking at the temptations and challenges we face. Now, that victory that we're looking for, the solution we want, it may not be immediate, and most likely it will not look the way that we want it to, but God will work out all things for those who love him. Now, for Jesus, when we apply that to this situation, Jesus left that moment of temptation. He left that challenge and was immediately hit with the fact that his cousin, John the Baptist, was imprisoned. Talk about a victory after that big challenge, immediately being hit by another thing. 
And we can see that even though we face challenges, even though we have victory, there's still yet things we're going to work through. And it's not going to look all pretty and roses at the end of it. But Jesus was full of the Spirit. He had quieted himself in the desert alone with his Father. And he was ready for what God had planned. The challenge by Satan was overcome, and it was time. In Matthew 4, 17, as Jesus prophetically situated himself in Capernaum to start his ministry, we see he was actively on his mission. For we read, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus begins to declare reality to a world that had bought into a lie. Today, as we have quieted our hearts before God, We've sought him. We've sought the Holy Spirit to show us what he's doing and what he's working on in our lives, even in the midst of challenges and brokenness. We've sought God to surrender our challenges to Jesus. We've sought him to step in and start practicing spiritual disciplines, acts of forgiveness and other things that will help us in that journey. We've also sought to, to trust God to trust his character, to trust who he says he is as revealed by scripture. We've come through that now, and now it's time for action. Greg Reed said, a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. And a plan backed by action makes your dreams come true. So our closing question is this, in the next 100 days, what is one thing that you'll do to take this word from idea to action? How can you take the vision that God has given you and make it into reality? How can you change the habits that you've formed in life and the reactions that you've, you've consistently done to face a new reality and a new course and trajectory that God has for you now? A key to this can be to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for an anchoring Bible scripture that can lead you for the year. Something that's based off his character, his promises, and the revealed reality that he has for you. Is there an anchoring verse that can be an encouraging, faith-forming, habit-building truth for you to anchor in? This year, let's grow together and see what God has for us.